Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My JavaScript Story. We're also going to put this on the My Angular Story feed, so if that's where you're getting this, don't be shocked. Um, we're talking to Joe Eames again. Joe, do you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Now, you were episode five of My JavaScript Story and episode 49 of My Angular Story. Mm -hmm. And you've been a panelist on Adventures in Angular and JavaScript Jabber for quite a long time. Quite a long time. And so, yeah, we've already kind of done the, I guess, the standard interview where we talk about your story and where you came from and how you got into programming and all that stuff. But you've been doing some interesting stuff lately, and I thought we could uh, dive in a little bit more on that and kind of get, I guess, the next chapter of your story, if that makes sense. Sounds good. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So um, I think we talked a little bit about the conferences. Um, and, and I don't know if we want to start there, if we want to start with Thinkster. Uh, which way would you like to go? Well, let's start with the conferences. All right, good deal. Um, so one conference that you, I don't think you had started at the point that we released the episodes last time was um, the Framework Summit. We might have right. talked about it on my Angular story because that was later. Right. But do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that went? Yeah. Um, uh, so, boy, how, to, like, how far back and how much to tell? I think... Where did it come from? Let's start there. Yeah, so... Like many, many, many amazing ideas that I have been involved with that actually came from Eric Christensen. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so funny because um, like the guy is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my entire life. He's just amazingly smart, but he also lives like a, like a very like conservative type life, right? Uh -huh. So he just wants to like work his job and I keep saying, dude, let's go and build this thing. Let's go do this thing. And he's like, I'm happy. He loves Webflow. He works over at Webflow. Mm -hmm. And they're an amazing company with an amazing product. But when he was helping organize ng-conf way back in the day, um, he had this idea, like, wouldn't it be great to have a conference about, at the time, Vue wasn't really on the scene. So it was, you know, a conference about Ember, React, and Angular. And to talk about all three and... So that was like the original idea and various people talked about it at various points. And then finally I was like, all right, it's time. We've got to make this sort of thing happen. So um, I uh, teamed up with a couple of people, um, find, found a really good React guy uh, by Sean Larkin helped us get it started. Tyler McGinnis, John Papa, Dan Walleen, um, Dave Smith was our like, MC year one and Barrett Christensen. Should I name everybody? I think I named everybody, but there's so many more people that were really involved. And we just right. said, you know, let's just create a conference about this. And, uh, you know, 100% honesty here. Uh, the year, first year reaction wasn't nearly as good as I was hoping for as far as like number of tickets that sold. But what did happen, which we uh, really wanted to do was we got a member of a representative from every well, not every, from five of the major framework teams. So Elm, Ember, React, Angular, and Vue. Right. And then we, uh, we got them all in a room for a whole day just to talk about things that mattered to all of them and coordinate, talk to each other, talk about, uh, you know, stuff that affects everybody like web components. And um, <clears throat> they really had, uh, they all felt like that was uh an amazing meeting. And for me, it was super fun to just be a fly on the wall and be in the room, just listening to what they're talking about and uh, hear what for them was really major concerns and things that problems that they wanted to solve and how they 
you know, could team up together to solve these problems. So it was great. Uh, that happened the day before the actual conference. And then we actually had the conference, which was just a, a, a small two day affair. Um, it ended up being small and intimate, like 150 people. And mm -hmm. we got a lot of good feedback about that. So we might try to kind of keep it about the same size this next year. Um, we're skipping 2019 because we're just moving to January. So technically, uh, it's not like a two year wait or anything, but we decided to move the conference to January. So it's going to happen in 2020 in January in Salt Lake. Um, and uh, I'm excited again to have it again. For me, it's definitely a passion project because uh, one of the reasons I really picked up on it was because I saw so many people that were uh, about the fact that there's a, some religiosity to frameworks. And I really despise that. Even if I notice my own, you know, unconscious biases about, various technologies and stuff but i don't like the idea that uh, people take a religious position on one technology right. is right and one is wrong you know even technologies that i would ubiquitously like uh, feel like i could objectively say you shouldn't use this technology anymore to call it right or wrong you know just because the, the, those technologies days have passed but the reality is if i might meet somebody who's using that technology and that's really the right decision for them to be using that technology, whether it's because they just don't need to spend time upgrading to something new or that for various reasons, that is the right technology for their company, their project to be using. So I really wanted to put a conference together where people who either didn't have a dog in the fight, right? They didn't care. If you, you talk to so many full stack developers, they don't get this concept of why are people saying that this framework is better than that framework they're yeah. just frameworks <laughs> really what matters is c sharp is better than java or vice versa right or rails you know everybody should be rails, using rails. <laughs> no um for those people who you know places that uh do multiple frameworks there are plenty of places out there that have projects yeah. in multiple frameworks right or people that are doing one framework and want to do a different framework uh, or people who really are heavily into one framework, but want to understand the other frameworks and talk intelligently about them, or just recognize their own biases and want to expose themselves to more than what they're being exposed to at their current job. So right. that was the idea. And man, it was great because we, I started discovering all these other frameworks that existed that I didn't know, like that were super cool. Uh, <clears throat> um, the Rails one, um, crap, what's Similar. it called? Stimulus. <laughs> I always forget because it doesn't have a weird name, right? I know, right? Like they Svelte. Really, yeah, like, like, and that's, that's another great example is Svelte, right? It's a weird name, easier to remember, but a super cool concept. I like, like, Stimulus is really interesting because it's like Framework Lite or Svelte is really interesting because there's no JavaScript runtime to it. You just, it just compiles down to just plain old ES5 JavaScript. There's no runtime delivered down to the browser. So the, you know, the hello world size is literally a, a, a few, you know, a few hundred bytes, right? right. Like, yeah, <laughs> uh, just really cool stuff that other places are doing. Um, I thought that was for me really fun and getting to see a wide variety of stuff. I really liked it. So yep. I was happy that it was successful. We didn't actually lose money. That was great. And, uh, um, uh, I, I was really happy with, with what went on. Definitely a passion project uh, of mine. Yeah. So I, I am a little curious. Why move the conference to January? Oh, my gosh. Conference space is so crowded in the fall. Uh, I don't know if it's just in Utah. I mean, cons even considering uh, worldwide ones. But, you know, the Framework Summit is about front-end frameworks. Uh -huh. So... Like one of the definitely direct competitors would just be the Utah JavaScript conference. Cause we have a fair right. amount of locals that go to the framework summit. So it's a low cost, you know, short conference. So people that are going to go to Utah JS are potentially going to go to this one. And if then Utah JS is in the fall, then we've got react rally, another Utah conference. Yep. that's also in the fall. And so people that go to that might potentially be people that would want to go to the framework summit. Then react conf is in the fall and angular connect is in the fall. And so there was just so many conferences that felt like, all right, these are potentially we might lose customers because they, their bosses don't want them to be gone twice within, you know, a 30 day or 60 day time span. So looking at it, it seemed like January was a, just a lot less competition, especially amongst the conferences that really mattered to us, either the local conferences or the national level ones that were about that particular framework. Of course, there's no perfect time. 
but we'll probably find out that we're right during, you know, view Amsterdam or something, <laughs> whatever it is, but you just got to accept that. But certainly the ones that I was particularly worried about react conf NG conf. Right. Uh, and then the locals react rally and Utah, Utah JS conference. I wanted to be farther away from those. So we decided to push it back and um, do it in January. Plus January is a good time to come to Utah. You might, you know, yes, it is snowing, but there's also skiing here. So, and it, man, it's beautiful. Yep. Yeah, it is. It's, it's amazing here. So you said you're going to do it in Salt Lake or are you going to do yeah. it in City again? Now we're, we're going to move it down to Salt Lake, make it a little bit easy for people that are traveling to just get to the venue and right. find a little bit better at venue. The venue that we chose, the hotel that we chose wasn't like ideal. There's a couple of problems with using that hotel and just, there's a really limited choices up at Park City. I wish there were better choices. There yeah. just really isn't. So it made more sense to move it down into Salt Lake and then we'll, and that way we're also actually, strangely enough, uh, other than one resort, there's there's a, a quite a few more resorts that are actually really close. There's four really fantastic resorts, whereas mm -hmm. if you go up to Park City, there's just like two that are close. So it gives more options if people do want to ski. Yeah, I keep thinking about uh, doing a podcasting conference. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I could go into all the reasons for that. But basically, yeah, doing one in Salt Lake, I'd like to do one, you know, uh, at or near a resort. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of cool resorts in Utah. Yep. So yeah, so that that's that's really interesting. And yeah, I I, I was at um Framework Summit. You know this, but you know, the listeners might not be aware of that. Um and yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Um and it was really nice that it was small. Yeah. So I got to talk to a lot of people that I don't know if I would have run into otherwise. Um right. yeah. I, I definitely agree. The venue the venue wasn't ideal. Um but I mean, it worked and it was, it was a good conference. So, right. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So you, you kind of have been uh, working that into things and I know you do a bunch of other conferences. I don't know if I know what all of them are. So yeah, I, uh, I can't, can't remember based on what was last, if we talked about react conf, but uh, yes. now I'm or hoping to organize react conf as well myself, along with the two react rally organizers, Jameson dance and Matt Zabriskie. And uh, for me, this one was a particular, again, um, exciting thing because six plus years ago, I actually came, went to the React team and said, right as soon as we'd kind of started doing ng-conf, and I think right after the first year of ng-conf, and I told them, hey, there should be a conference for React. There wasn't at the time, mm -hmm. and I'll do it for you. And they said, that's a great idea, but we'll do it ourselves, thanks. And so they did. And then uh, in 2018, they had like late 2017, they announced that they were going to cancel React Conf they were going to have for 2018. And the reason being is that the team was organizing it and there's just so much to do. And some of the people had left and they realized, man, we just don't have the time to do it. We got too many other important things to do. That's when myself and Jameson and Matt reached out to the React team and said, hey, you can't not have React Conf. Yeah. <laughs> like that doesn't work. So if you'll let us organize it, we'll organize it for you. And you know, we don't care if uh, we'll volunteer all of our time. Uh, we just want to make sure that this actually happens. It's too important to the community. This is like a really big deal and we're happy to do it. So um, we, that set in plans of motion we, we started discussing and we, it was funny. We kind of went in thinking we're going to have to sell them on the fact that we would do this. We were the right people to choose and we could do it. And in our first meeting with them, they're like, well, we're really excited to have you guys doing this for us. Nice. <laughs> and we were all like, Oh, I guess we can move past that part of the agenda of why we're the right people to do it. And let's just talk about what we need to do. Yeah. And so, uh, then, you know, we moved it out to Vegas this last year. It just was an amazing resort. And uh, it, that went really well. And I really had a great time um, organizing that one and being involved with uh, React Conf as well. And I'm super happy we are, we're in full swing planning next year or this, well, this year, 2019. So we're in full swing making the plans for that and putting that together. And uh, I'm just, again, super excited to be involved and to, um, I love planning conferences and organizing conferences. It's it's really enjoyable work for me. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah, React Conf and Framework Summit are kind of the big ones since we talked. Yep. 
Yep, had plenty of other ideas that we haven't pulled the trigger on. There's always more conference ideas, but surprisingly enough, there is uh, there's so much risk in them and not nearly as much reward as you would hope. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a lot more gun shy about trying to organize new conferences because I'm just too afraid to lose money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they take a lot of time and energy and the fact that you can spend a couple of hundred hours doing something throughout a year and then end up losing 20 or so thousand dollars and have to split that up with all of your friends that you involved. And they're like, wait a second. <laughs> we didn't know that we were going to have to pay to help out with this. So yeah. Yeah. That doesn't really work out, but I'd love to do more conferences. I really like the work. I think it's super fun. I'm just, I don't know. Events are fun, right? Everybody's there to have a good time and to learn and to grow and to talk and to socialize and to mingle. And I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, one other thing that I, I guess uh, we should bring up is that you've also started your own podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. Started a podcast up. Um, yeah, connected with Thinkster, the company I'm the CEO of now, but uh, we started a podcast about developer education. I felt like there wasn't, like, this is a, this is a topic that I've myself yeah. been crazy passionate about for a long time. I would consider myself, I have no, like, uh, formal training in education, per se. I wish I did, but um, <laughs> I, I would definitely, could, more. yeah, yeah. Uh, I would definitely consider myself to be a uh, amateur enthusiast in the subject of what it means to learn and to be educated about something. And, you know, obviously that makes a lot of uh, overlap with what I do as uh, in my job, either authoring courses um, for Pluralsight or other places, producing uh, conferences and what we do. And um, so I'm very passionate about that subject. So we started up a podcast to just talk about education for developers in general and cover everything from what's a, you know getting educated so you can become a developer to staying educated to continue to being a developer educating children to get them ready to become developers um, the different products that are out there and tools that are out there to stay up to date or to get up to date or to uh, just get into the industry right there's just so many things to talk about so many cool products and cool um, companies out there that are doing amazing things. So uh, what, what I really like about that versus the other podcasts that I'm on, uh, I was on Views on View for a while, but Adventures mm -hmm. in Angular and JavaScript Jabber is they're very discussion focused versus uh, a lot of times on the other podcasts, we're interviewing a guest about what something about what that guest is involved in, a, a product they've produced, a blog right. article that they've written, whatever, which is very interesting. And I'm sure for the listener, like very super, super valuable. But as a panelist, oftentimes either, maybe you don't care a ton about the subject mm -hmm. uh, that particular week. Sometimes you do, and then you really yeah. get involved, but sometimes you're just like, eh, I'm, I'm okay, right? Like somebody else can be involved <laughs> and, ask, and ask all the questions and I'll just sort of sit quietly. But also you're really there to hear from that person, right? So there's just, yeah. other than asking questions as a panelist, mostly you don't engage nearly as much until things come in and somebody says, hey, I don't like frameworks. And then it's like, all right, it's on, let's. Yeah, let's <laughs> I love those. <laughs> so obviously my favorite episodes of those ones have been the ones that are very subjective topics of a discussion and, and really my favorites are when me and Ward Bell get in an argument about something. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's an argument about something stupid too, which right, is also fun. Right. Right. Exactly. So those have been my favorite because for, as a panelist, they're the most engaging. Right. right? Um, I feel like we, in every case, do an amazing job of providing value to the listeners. Right. And that's yeah. reflected in the fact that those podcasts are really heavily listened to. But uh, what's nice so far about this DevEd podcast is that it's really been a bunch of panelists talking through a subject. So, uh, like, I'm the host. So far, I've been the only host. Um, that won't be true forever. But so far, I've been the only host. And then as I'm hosting, it's like, all right, here's the question. And it's almost like a coffee talk or, you know, what is the right. show's table talk or something like that. Like, all right, here's the question. All right, discuss. And either we go around the panel and have everybody chip in, or if we have a big panel, it's just whoever wants to chip in on that particular topic. 
or, or question, right? And we discussed that question. So today, on the we had the podcast earlier today. We recorded it. We were talking about boot camps. And so the first question was, are boot camps even worth the price? And then everybody gets to discuss and debate. Are they worth the price that they charge? And then, you know, then, then we move on to the next question. And I've really found that engaging. There's a lot of discussion. It's really fun. It's a lot really more involved for me as a panelist. So I've really enjoyed the podcast. And like today, especially, I felt like we produced a really valuable podcast to people who are either in boot camp or thinking about going to a boot camp because we right. talked a lot about how to pick the good boot camp, right? And what to do while you're in boot camp to be successful and when you're ready to get a job, what are all the things you could do? We talked a lot about a lot of stuff that I think will be really valuable to people that are in that particular situation. And I assume we're gonna have a lot more valuable discussions to people you know, based on the topic, like as we continue to discuss, if you're a full-time developer and you just stay up to date, right? Yeah. What are the ways to do that? And, Lots of really interesting content and products will come out of that. So really enjoyed that podcast. I'm excited to uh, be involved with it. We're, I don't know, four episodes now in and yep. uh, really enjoying it. And thankfully I've got help from somebody who knows the podcasting world really well to help me get it <laughs> off the ground. Yeah, it, it's, it's been fun to help with that. Um, funny enough, I've, I could, I guess, if I wanted to listen to those and I haven't yet. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I've just been busy. So I just make sure that the, the editors have it and that all that work right. gets done. But yeah. Right. Um, and I know as we record this, it's launching soon. By the time this goes live, it should be out there for people to consume. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, another aspect of this whole like study of education I want to mention was um like I realized that we're not doing a great job with our like workshops at NG Comp. We with we have this like middle day where we have these one and two mm -hmm. hour workshops, and yep. they ended up just being like big long talks. So because of all this like study and focus I've had about developer education, we switched this year our workshops, and we actually dictated to the presenters a minimum of fifty percent of the time must be the attendees actually doing something, doing some coding. Oh wow. Right? So you can't get it up for an hour or two hours and just give a longer talk than you would give if you were just doing giving a regular old one of our 20 minute talks, right? No, you gotta go, it's gotta be a workshop, it's gotta be hands-on. So if you got the, you know, one hour, which really is like 50, 55 minutes, then you can't spend any more than 25 minutes talking and the other right. 30 minutes needs to be people actually practicing something, a, 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 mm -hmm. an exercise you've given them to do. I think, Last year, I sat in on an Ionic talk or an Ionic two-hour workshop, and it was, mm -hmm. yeah, there there was some coding, but it was mostly them walking us through it. Was that and it? and that, I, I mean, I understand they wanted to get a working something or other, you know, in front of us by the end of the, the thing. But yeah, I agree with you. Um, having that hands-on is really, really valuable, even if I have something to take home and work on later. Oh my gosh, you're going to put me on my soapbox talking through that stuff. <laughs> well, people can go listen to the podcast. Uh, where, where do they get it? Uh, it's at uh, devedpodcast.com. Yep. D-E-V-E-D. -E if you just look at it, it looks like Deved, Deved podcast, but it's yeah. Deved. <laughs> yeah. We'll make sure that uh, it's on iTunes and stuff as well. So iTunes, Google Play, that's what's where most right. people stuff. Right. So yeah, we'll work through that as well. Um, and, and that kind of leads into Thinkster, right? So yeah. you, you're the CEO of Thinkster. You acquired it from um, Eric and Albert. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing there? Because um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've looked at it recently and you know, we've, we've talked about some of the content there, but yeah, right. what, what are you trying to accomplish there? And what are you trying to get to as far as what people get out of it? Uh, I'm trying to not starve to death is my number one goal. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true at all. Uh, I'm, I'm not making any money from uh, Thinkster. So, uh, yeah, so Eric and Albert, Eric uh, Simons, Albert Pye, who were the people behind, the brains behind uh, StackBlitz and the uh, real world GitHub repo also started Thinkster. And um, 
they kind of had this really unique take on education where they re kind of they recorded a bunch of videos, courses, but they also created blog written out versions of them and the blog for forms are pretty much free. So if you can't afford to pay a subscription to get the videos, you can still get all the content for free. That was pretty cool. Um, and uh, they started this up and then they kind of built Stackblitz as sort of a, they needed a tool for the, um, for the, the site. They right. wanted a tool where people could code in the browser. And they started doing Stackblitz and they got sitting engaged in it and it drew great, kind of created this life of its own that um, it was going so well, they sort of just decided, well, let's forget about Thinkster, let's just do Stackblitz. And so uh, they were gonna just let Thinkster sort of die out. And that was when I met them uh, almost exactly one year ago, a year and a month ago, on uh, the JavaScript Jabber podcast, I believe, mm -hmm. talking yeah. about Stackblitz. And afterwards, I reached out to them and said, hey, you know, you're telling, talking about this other company, and I don't know what's going on there, but let's talk. Maybe there's some option for us to coordinate or, you know, work together. And they were very interested, and then it sort of ended up being that I kind of just took over the company and took it over from them. So that it took a while that only barely started in December. Right. And um, so now um, I'm in the process of uh, putting out just a whole bunch of up-to-date content on, on Thinkster to, you know, educate developers, but meanwhile also trying to do something sort of unique in the space. Right. Yeah. And, and I uh, think that's kind of what I'm driving at is that, you know, there are other companies that are out there producing training content and so, yeah, what, what is the unique thing that you're doing over at Thinkster? Well, there's certainly a couple of things, and I'll start with some of the smaller ones. Um, one of the things that you sneak about Thinkster is using the real-world uh, GitHub repo. Uh, you can basically choose any front end and any back end and learn to build an entire application with those two mm -hmm. pieces. And everywhere else, that's far more difficult because they have to produce, you know, X number of versions of right. a course, right? If you want to do... Rails on the back end and you want to do view on the front end, you're going to have a hard time right now finding a Rails view combination course right. on Pluralsight or Rails Angular combination course on Pluralsight. But with uh, Thinkster, we can do that because you just pick your back end, your front end, you go through and learn that and you learn how to build this real world app that has this well-defined API and then you pick your back end. You want to use Django, you want to use Rails, you want to use Node. Um, you just pick the, pick the right one that you want. And then you, when you're done, you've built up a whole entire new app. So that's one thing that's kind of unique. The other thing, like I said, was having a lot of written versions of uh, the content that's out there so that people can come and still get some of the value for free. And you know, that varies from piece to piece based on um, what we actually have and what we, we get published. But um, that's also another kind of unique thing about uh, Thinkster is that. But what really will be unique is the stuff that we're trying to change and add to it now. So that's stuff that's already existed. But what we're going to be doing, adding to it in the next year is, I feel like, what the really most important and compelling piece is. So when I took over Thinkster, the first person that I hired was an educational director. And this is a woman who has a master's degree in education. She was a school teacher for eight years. And my goal was to improve the way that developers are educated because I, I see this huge problem. And the more I get into it, the more frustrated I get whenever I try to learn anything myself, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I'm trying to pick up rails and having a hard time finding good quality content out there. And it's not the fault so much of the presenters as the teachers, as far as like, they're not good teachers. It's that um, people don't, by and large, understand the foundations of what it means to get educated and to teach something, right? Even though inherently we actually understand this fairly well. Um, if you want to learn to ride a bike, the one thing you don't do is order the video on how to ride a bike and watch the video <laughs> on how to ride a bike. Yet that's what we do in development. I want to learn Vue. Well, I go and I find the, the Vue course on how to learn Vue. And all I do is I watch somebody else doing view. And at best, I follow in their footsteps, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, imagine learning to ride a bike if all you did was your parent told you, well, sit down, watch me ride around, see, and see how I do this. And right. do right? what I do. Yeah. Now, just, just go ahead and do what I do. And I'm going to go inside and watch Wheel of Fortune and you have fun riding your bike now, 
right? Yeah. Like we'd never learn to, to do anything if that was how we were taught. So, so hey guys, let me tell you about Clubhouse. I swear I've used every project management software there is out there and I hated project management software. Now I have Clubhouse. Overall, it's simple and straightforward to use, but it has enough of the integrations and power features you need to get the job done without getting confusing. This means that I can use it and the non-technical members of my team can figure out what they need from it. It also makes it easy for me to zoom out and see what's going on overall before zooming back in and specifying more work that needs to be done or picking the next task for me to tackle. They integrate with all the systems that you'd expect and have a REST API for, well, the rest. If you go to https clubhouse.io slash JS story, you can get two months free instead of the standard 14-day trial for any team size. Once again, that's https clubhouse.io slash JS story. Yeah. So what, what really needs to happen is there, it's missing a... Uh, there's a lot of educational principles that are missing in that scenario, but one of the key ones is called generation. So mm -hmm. generation is where you actually are given an incomplete thing and you have to produce the solution. So as an example, Oh, interesting. Um, if you, um, if you're learning math, for example, mm -hmm. right, you don't learn math because you teach us two plus two is four, three plus two is five. And let me know if you have any other questions about what two numbers equal what number, right? Mm -hmm. No, the teacher teaches you the principles behind it, but then makes you practice and you do several examples until you feel like, okay, I got this well enough that it doesn't matter which two numbers you give me, I can produce the answer. My right? kids whine at me a lot during that phase. <laughs> Just saying. Or, uh, or going back to the bike riding, right? How do we learn to ride a bike? Well, our, I, I've taught all my kids to ride and I've taught several other kids to ride bikes as well. I sit them on the bike and I, Tell them, all right, sit down on the seat. I'm going to hold it up so you can't fall over. Put, put, your pedal, put your feet on the pedals. Just feel what it's like to have your feet on the pedals. Okay, now reach up and grab the handlebars. Feel what it's like to hold the handlebars. All right, now reach out and grab the brake and squeeze the brake. And feel what it's like to just squeeze the brake. We're n you're not actually braking. We're not moving. But just feel what it's like. All right, now I'm going to start walking, and I'm walking, and I'm holding the bicycle up. All right, now go ahead and engage the brake. And they engage it. They feel it stop. They feel that what they do has an effect. Right. But what I'm, and then pretty soon I'll say, all right, now brake. And they're the ones who have to decide, I got to squeeze my right hand mm -hmm. to break. And they get to feel, just get to practice that. Do I just really grab onto it right immediately and squeeze the whole thing super hard? Or do I slowly engage it and have it feel more smooth? And, right. it? and when you're teaching a kid how to ride a motorcycle, which I've done that as well, that gets to be even more the same when you got to teach them. The, you know, it's very important that you get them in the habit of when there's a problem, you don't grip the throttle <laughs> and turn it down because that's what so many people happen so i train my kids there's a problem and i train them to let off of the gas don't grab the brake mm -hmm. let off the gas right, right. that was that's the first thing i train them and get them in the habit of there's a problem and i let off the gas right so i'm training them these right things uh right patterns of behavior mm -hmm. that's the same thing we need to be doing in development is we need to actually train the learners Right. on things and we're not doing that instead we're just saying here i'm doing this thing if you want at best it's type along and follow me right mm -hmm. so somebody's typing along and all that becomes this typing practice they might as well be putting in a random string of characters and saying type this random string of characters out because even though they're trying to explain it the person's so busy typing they can't listen and hear what they're doing and even if you even if you're so good that you can type and listen to what the person's saying and comprehend what they're saying what you are not doing is you're not doing any generation you are not making a decision at all. You've never made a decision. So if you've never, if your brain has never in any sense of the word made a decision about programming, whatever it is that you're learning, right? View, Rails, whatever, you aren't learning how to do that thing. You're just learning how to parrot somebody else. And so when it comes time to actually do your own thing, like it doesn't do any good to learn how to build one exact app. You need to learn how to build apps, right? right. So I need to build a weight tracking app and you're teaching me how to do a point of sale app, I don't need to learn to be right. able to produce that exact point of sale app. I need to be able to produce apps. And so how do I deal with routing? How do I deal with state management? How do I deal with variables? How do I deal with rendering to the screen and dealing with the DOM? Mm -hmm. How do I deal with those things? And how can I adapt what you show me into the scenario that works for me? And we only learn that by actually doing and trying and practicing. So yep. that's what we're going to be doing at Thinkster is our, the new content that we're putting out will actually incorporate hands-on not just follow me and do exactly what i do and type in exactly what i'm asking you to type in mm -hmm. but instead 
I've showed you this thing. You watched me do this thing, right? And I, now you need to do this. I'm going to give you a problem and you need to solve the problem. I'm not giving you the answer. I'm asking you to figure out the answer. You've got to actually, right. based on what I told you, because well, you were paying attention and not typing, you were actually watching me and listening. You've got the information. Now generate what the correct solution is to this scenario. And when we ride a bike, right, our parents, they're running alongside of us pretty soon. We're, we're running and we're pedaling and they start lifting their hands up off the handlebars and then putting it and on the seat and putting it back down. They do that a few times and pretty soon they lift their hands up and they stop and you're riding and they tell you, ride the end of the street and stop. And you got that moment of fear. Oh my gosh, I'm riding. I might fall over. There isn't anybody here holding my, the hand, holding the seat, right. making sure I don't fall over. And then you ride to the end of the street and you stop and you realize, oh my gosh, I actually can ride a bike. Mm -hmm. And that realization cannot come and that confidence cannot come until you actually do that. No amount of watching your parent ride a bike, no amount of coaching can right. convince you that you can ride a bike until you go and do it. And it's the same thing with coding. You don't know that you can create routing tables with Angular by watching somebody create a routing table with Angular. You have to actually do it. I don't know how many times I have read blogs about using async await, and yet I have yet <laughs> to ever actually do async await. So I would not feel comfortable. Uh, right. I certainly wouldn't be able to do it off the top of my head. I have to go and look at somebody's example, copy paste and see if I could figure out and make it work for me. Or uh, RxJS is switch map, right? It's kind yeah. of a complex thing. And I've read five blogs and seen three presentations about using switch map and I still can't use switch map because I've never done it for myself. Never utilized it and seen how it works and gotten the, the grasp of it. Right. Well, it's so. funny too, because you know, you're, you're talking about this particular problem and I get bored. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I don't think I've watched an entire plural site course. Uh huh. <laughs> and so what, That's what true. usually happens is, I'll watch the first hour or so, just enough to kind of get me set up. Uh -huh. um, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, parrot type the first bit. And uh -huh. then, I'll, okay, All right. I'm going to go crash my bike. <laughs> 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 right? And then uh -huh. I'll go do it on my own because I get bored with those. And so I, I like the approach of, okay, you know, we've gotten you to this point. Now go figure out the next piece because right. I would engage on that. Right. But I don't, I don't engage on, okay, now type this in, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there's a little bit of discovery, right? Type this in. Okay. Now refresh the page. Okay. Now it did something and right. you know, here's how it worked, but it's another thing entirely to say, okay, you should understand enough to actually go write this on your own. And that's where I'm always trying to get to. Right. And so right. typically it's, here's the example app we're writing. And so I pick something that's similar, but a little different. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then I'll go and I'll build that on my own on the side as I go through the course. Right. And that's why I never finish the courses. And so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I, I really, really love the approach because it's, it's then, okay, we're, you know, we're going to get you so far and then you've got to figure it out from there. Right. Right. Yeah. So we actually have like a ton more plans about incorporating more educational principles to, uh, make the education more effective mm -hmm. and deal with the problem that like for me, I'll go and I'll watch a plural site course on a topic and then I'll go watch the egghead IO course on the topic. And then I'll go find a Udemy course and buy that and watch that on that same topic. And then I'll go read five blogs. And after I've done all that, I think, well, maybe by this time it might've enough of it might've sunk in. I've seen five different people talk about the topic that right. maybe it's sunk in enough I can go and actually try it out on my own. That's sort of how I approach it. I'm just waiting for enough people to say the same thing over and over and over again that it sinks in because I'm never at any point going off and actually mm -hmm. doing it on my own and playing around with it on my own. And that's so in addition to just like, obviously we want to produce high quality stuff. Right. We actually want to produce we're going to be producing actual, like you're going to do a couple of things and then you're going to do a little project and then you're going to do a couple, learn, learn something, then you're going to practice it and you're going to learn something, practice it. And then at the end of, you know, like the big routing section, now you're going to have a big practice. You have to do a whole major thing about routing or after the right. section on components, a whole major thing about components. Right. And then, um, but actually like doing and not just reading and watching and other people do. Yeah. I mean, one other thing here is that um, I think in a lot of cases, 
companies and developers both have a similar problem in that they don't really think about this stuff, right? They're mm -hmm. not thinking about how do I learn this stuff or whatever. And so when they encounter something new, they just kind of Google and muddle their way through it. Or, you know, they'll say, oh, I wonder if there is a course on this on Pearl site and then they'll go watch it. Right. But, um, you know, nobody actually sits down and thinks, okay, what's the best way for me to learn this? Right. And, and the employers, you know, they, they, they kind of do the same thing, right? Where it's, we need this feature done or we need this, you know, we're, we're going to incorporate this library or this framework. And then there's no, there's no guidance beyond that. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's no clear, okay, so this is how you're going to learn it or whatever. I mean, some of them will hire somebody to come into the company and train their team on it and things like that. Of course, then they never do anything with it. So three months down the road, it's like, okay, we're finally ready to implement Angular. And everybody's going, I forgot Angular. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, I, you know, it, it's interesting, too, that you're having the conversations about it and talking about what is the best way to learn this stuff and how right. do we get people to the point where they're proficient enough with it to, to use it. And proficient enough isn't necessarily off the top of my head, I can use Switch Map. Proficient right. enough is um, I can go look at the docs and I'm familiar enough to yes. where I can come back and implement it without having to spin my wheels too much. Right. Yeah. I'm me personally, I'm just so frustrated spending four or five hours to learn something that if I had a mentor next to me, yeah, giving, giving me exercises and telling me, all right, try to do this. Now try this. Now try this like a coach. I would mm -hmm. learn that same stuff in half an hour, but because all it is is talking heads talking at me and I am chief among these. I've produced 25 courses for Pluralsight. I've got a mil, over a million viewed hours. That's maybe that was something we should have, I should have mentioned above. That's something that's hit in the last little bit in December. I hit a million viewed hours on Pluralsight. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So for over a million hours, people have watched me, listen to me talk and just talk at them and tell them about something without actually convincing, with the exception of actually one course. So my Angular, my Pluralsight's, uh, Angular Fundamentals course actually incorporates this principle of here's these exercises. Unfortunately, the platform doesn't really allow for it, which is what's great about Thinkster is our right. platform is really integrated so that you can actually be watching the video and then go right to doing the exercise in the same browser window and not have to leave and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm so tired of spending hours and hours and hours to learn something that should only take 30 minutes if I had opportunities to actually practice it on my own, but practice just what the, the, the next piece that I don't understand, right? Like right. If, it's, if it's RxJS, I got the basics down, but I don't know switch map. So just give me like the first scenario of switch map that makes sense, then a couple more, and then I'll have it down. Right. But don't tell me about it for two hours because telling me about it for two hours, you know, mm -hmm. it's better to tell somebody something once and have them practice it than to tell them something 10 times. Yeah, I mean, there's something to understanding the principles. Yep. But, yep, you still need to have it explained. Yeah. You can't just be thrown into the deep end of the pool, so to say. We'd have a lot of drowned people if that was actually how we did things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, get it explained to you and then practice it. And practice just the piece that's next, just the piece that's next for you. Mm -hmm. What is it that you don't, can't use yet and just practice that piece and be so you can self-pace it and right. just the way that the coach or a mentor would who is teaching you something. Yep. I love it. Yeah. So I'm really excited. We, we've got like 15 authors currently producing courses right now. And we're bringing online about uh, 15 other courses. We've got a big, huge Docker course, like hours and hours of Docker content, which is amazing and great for me because I've always wanted to learn Docker and never bothered to. So I'm actually going through the course myself, <laughs> learning I, Docker. I, yeah, I think that's interesting too, where it can almost be a, well, the course is good because I can figure it out from your course, right? Right. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. yeah, we're bringing on like 15 courses. We brought on some React and some Vue content. And we got um, some more Angular, GraphQL, um, unit testing content coming on here pretty quick. And then mm -hmm. um, these courses that these authors are authoring for us will start coming online in the next like month, month and a half. Right. Um, that'll be more like what I'm talking about. You know, what we're, what I've been talking about really so far doesn't quite exist yet. I'll be, I'll be putting some of that together myself for angular over the next mm -hmm. month or two. But, um, these, these authors start producing stuff. I'm excited. We got a really cool looking accessibility course coming out and a basic JavaScript course coming out. 
that'll be like this with lots of practice. You can really learn something. Uh, did you ever do a uh, code school? I did a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know Greg uh, fairly well. Yeah. yeah. Code school is such so great because it's like, I actually get to practice doing yeah. this stuff and I can learn Java. I mean, I learned JavaScript long before code school, but I thought it was so fun to go and check it out and see like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. You actually get to practice it. Yeah. Well, and you know, they, they had their, uh, um, you know, they, they all had kind of a story to them and things like that, that made it memorable and easy to follow and things like that. Mm -hmm. That was always a positive thing too. Right. Right. Well, you know, another kind of interesting thing about this whole thing is oftentimes the things that are bad for us educationally are the things that we think are good for us. Mm -hmm. um, as an example, you know, things that feel easy, we like when we are, when it comes to our own study, if we are completely self-paced, so we, we like the easy stuff mm -hmm. and the easy stuff that makes us feel like we're getting better at something. But the reality is, is if we changed up how we learned, it might be less enjoyable, but we might learn more effectively. So what matters more to you, your time or just getting a warm fuzzy? And uh, so there's actually a little bit of a balance point there to not make people like, make them feel like they're getting the win before they actually realize they're getting a much bigger win because they're doing right. something, you know, convince them to do something that's a little bit harder. So like there's this principle called interleaving. Uh -huh. um, and interleaving means to not just do one thing over and over and over again until your mastery level gets high with that thing, but actually do, do something and then do something different and then do something else and then come back to the first thing, either, right. in a, you know, sort of a random order. So as an example, uh, there's an interesting study done where they were trying to get some college level baseball players to improve their uh, batting. And so mm -hmm. these are already good batters, right? And they had, they split them up into two groups. And they had them practice three times a week for like 40 minutes or 30 minutes for six weeks. And at the end they assessed them And the first group, they each group took 45 pitches in each session. And in the first group, the pitches were the first 15 pitches were fastball. The next 15 pitches were curveball, And then the last 15 pitches were a changeup. And then the second group, the pitches came in a random order. So the first group felt like, oh my gosh, I'm getting so much better at my fastballs. And now I'm getting so much better. And they were, because they could start anticipating the fastballs as they were coming. So they were hitting those fastballs better as they came. And then it went to the changeups and the, or the, the curveballs. And they're like, oh, I'm ready for a curveball. It came and they'd hit it. And they were like, I'm hitting my curveballs better. I'm hitting my fastballs better. I'm hitting my changeups better. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other group didn't feel that way because they were like, all right, I don't know what's coming. Oh, it's this. And I try and I hit it. Okay. And then the next one, I kind of hit. Okay. And they're kind of coming at this random order. So I don't feel like I'm doing as well. But at the end, when they actually assessed after that six weeks, when they actually like put them in a real drill and either they, I don't know if they assessed them in games, or they just put a pitcher up that was just throwing pitches at them. The group that had done the random order had significantly better performance than the group that had had them done in the same order. Um, they call that principle interleaving and it's harder on you, right? Because it feels like, well, I don't get the chance to just keep practicing this thing until I'm really good at it. Right. But the reality is you get better faster overall when you're doing it the other way. And that's hard for people to sort of, you know, accept that it's better. You, you know, if you act, if you want somebody to comprehend text, put the text in a, in a blurry font <laughs> and make them read it because the extra focus it takes to, to actually focus and read the text causes it to be retained better right like weird things like that so actually it's called desirable difficulties and introducing these things actually increases learning and retention but it could be frustrating and uh, difficult for people to deal with this so um yeah it's 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 sort of interesting to work through this and make these plans as we uh put this this content together and put these features together as to what things are we going to do and how are we going to do them and how we're going to make it so that people aren't too frustrated, even though they're going to learn better, right? That they're still feeling enjoyment out of it. So they stay and learn, mm -hmm. but uh, we want them to have a harder time so that they learn better. Yeah. And it's the same thing. That's the same thing with just this practice, right? Like it feels better. Just watch you do it. When you make me do it, it's like, oh, I got to go over here and I got to figure this out. That's harder. I'd rather just watch you do it. And it makes right. me feel like I'm learning. But then when I actually go to go do it, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Because I haven't actually been practicing how to do it. Yeah. We haven't forced your brain to. Right. Exercises.
Right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's Thinkster in a nutshell. That's the cool. future of Thinkster in a nutshell. Well, uh, you convinced me that we need to get you on some of the shows to talk about learning. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, just going back over the, you know, your coding journey in the episodes that we mentioned at the beginning of the show. And then, you know, it, you, you kind of come up to, okay, this is what you're doing now and realize that, um, yeah, you know, a, a lot of this stuff's within reach. You know, if you want to create courses, you know, Joe's done a bunch of courses, um, right. you know, and I think you were pretty clear in, in the earlier episodes, you don't have a CS degree, you know, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing that, that really makes you stand out from the crowd other than that you just go and do it. And so right. I love the idea, you know, if you want to go organize a conference, you want to, um, you know, build courses, you want to, you know, do training. Any of these things are within reach. You just have to go out and, and you know, put in the work. Mm-hmm. Yep. Quite true. Quite true. No. Um, yeah. Like, the, of the 15 authors that we're working with only like four or five of them have produced courses before. And so we're really practicing what we're preaching too. Like we have a very comprehensive, like 10, 12 hour author onboarding process where we're taking people and really teaching them how to produce courses and produce them the right way and do a good job. And mm-hmm. you know, all understand these educational principles. So they're producing really high quality video courses. So, you know, if the things that we're talking about, if they, resonate with you and you want to get into creating uh online courses reach out to reach out to me and let's have a conversation yep absolutely well is there anything else that you've uh done or been doing that we haven't talked about you wanted to dive into uh been playing a lot of fun board games (laughs) (laughs) yeah we need to just get you and your wife over here and play some board Uh, games in our house or your house We'd have an episode just on board games. That would be fun. Do a bonus episode. (laughs) Bonus episode. Board game time. Yep. Cool. Well, uh, let's go ahead and do some picks. Maybe you can pick some board games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I did pick these on this one on a couple of the other podcasts. The other podcast I picked today. But I I, I spent the weekend playing board games at the SaltCon board game conference. They're doing three of them now a year because it's growing so fast. Utah. Did you know that Utah is the board game capital of the U.S.? Oh, really? We have the highest number of board game stores per capita of of anywhere in the U.S. My neighbors own a board game store. (laughs) Do they really? Yeah. It's funny because, yeah, I, I knew that she worked there and then yeah i I was chatting with somebody and it's like no they're i mean they own like 50 percent of the store with like some somebody else this is really that's funny that's funny so um yeah i got a couple of uh board game picks so if you're looking for a really kind of fun and unique sort of board game with that's really system based and really want to be able to like analyze probable not necessarily probabilities but possibilities and outcomes you know, a very programmer, maybe uh, appealing board game. There's a board game called Gizmos that we played, which is really fun. There's these little marbles you pick out and then you create these machines that uh, react to the actions that you take. And there's like all these different ways that you can build this machine to be, have the most efficient uh, set. So when you do this one thing, then that causes a chain reaction to happen over here. And then this chain reaction and this chain reaction. Um, it's really quite fun. So Gizmos. Uh, then we played another board game that was really awesome. It was based around it. You actually have to have an app on your phone to play it. And it's a detective game where you're investigating like a murder. And um, there's all these cards that represent the various people that you meet during the investigation. And each one has a QR code. So in the app, you're, you like scan the QR code for the location that you're going to. And then because of that, there'll be some people that are already there. And then you have to pick that person out of the deck and then you scan their QR code. That it means that now I'm talking to this person at this location. And then you can scan the QR codes for like items or other people. And that's you interrogating that person and asking them about, you know, tell me about the knife that we found or, uh, you know, tell me about this person, the, the dead body, you know? And so it's actually really it was really fun and you can play it by yourself. You can play it with one, just one person or you can play in a group of probably up to six or seven 
I would say, I mean, just pass around the uh, phone that has the app on it so everybody gets to take time to actually run the game, so to say, and, every, and then everybody else is like watching and listening to what's going on and putting in their opinion, well, we should try this, or maybe it's this person, maybe this is what happened, and let's try this. So really fun game um, called Chronicles of Crime. Um, so check that out. Um, Chronicles of Crime. Yeah, that's it. I was, couldn't remember if it was Chronicles of Crime or Chronicles on Crime or something like that. But uh, Chronicles of Crime, very fun game. And then I just today in the mail got arrived one more board game. That I'll, I'll show you the picture, but nobody else will be able to see it. It's called uh, Deep Space D6. So this is a single player board game. Where, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's based off of D Six Sided Die, and you're like on a spaceship that's like stranded, and you got to repair the systems and get out of there before things blow up, something like that. It's got really highly, highly rated, uh, highly high ratings, um, and so it's supposed to be a really fun, uh, engaging, and quick, sort of quick to play solitaire type game. And if you don't know about BoardGameGeek.com, you should definitely check out BoardGameGeek.com because it has a a lot of board games and they also have lots of user reviews and, and it's like yeah. the universal, it's the IMDB of board games. So you can find out, you know, what users are thinking, the reviews on uh, board games and stuff. So check that out. Board game yeah. Those yeah, are my board picks. Game, Boardgamegeek.com is awesome. And it's, it's funny cause it's not just the reviews, but right. my wife and I have been playing um, the second season of pandemic legacy with our neighbors. And, uh -huh. um, sometimes we need clarification on the rules and they have, oh, yeah. on too, and that that's always helpful. Yep. Of yep. course. Um, then people figure out how to hack the forum so that you can, uh, obscure stuff. Cause mm. that that's one of those progressive games where you don't want spoilers. Right. And so, yeah, anyway, it was kind of funny. I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Somebody figured mm. out how to hack the forum software, to <laughs> hide <laughs> stuff until you click on it. Right. But, uh, right. Yeah, it's it's super handy. So, um, we got clarifications on like the Harry Potter, um, battle, whatever game game that we have. Um, yeah, clarifications on the Pandemic Legacy, both of which are terrific games, by the way. Um, for if, if you're playing in a group, um, I play board games every month with a group of guys uh, that are my neighbors. They all live within like a block of me. And, uh, yeah, one of our favorite games is shadow hunters. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I like that one. I played that one, that one once I think. Yeah. One of our neighbors, uh, I don't know why, but he's always the guy that gets killed first. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Which is always funny. So yeah, it's, it's like, who am I going to, we're going to beat on Gareth. So yeah. Anyway, that's always fun. And then, um, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of other ones. Uh, the ones that w I've played with my wife and kids lately, um, we've played Villainous. Mm -hmm. and that's oh a, yeah, that's, that's such a, a cool game. game. It's a it's a fun yeah. game. Do you see there's an expansion coming out for it? I didn't. I was wondering because I was like, yep. they, they could go with a few more villains here, but you play as Disney villains and you're trying to essentially change your fate, and. Uh -huh. You, you do it, you know, by playing cards uh, in front of you on, on a little board. And, uh, yeah, you, you want to change your story before any of the other villains change theirs. That's how you win. And so you uh -huh. sabotage the other villains with fate cards and their heroes or, you know, it, it you know, take these off of the board or, yeah, anyway. So it, it messes with uh, their stuff. But um, some of the win conditions are pretty elaborate. So I think, like, Jafar, you have to um, you have to hypnotize the genie, but you have to get him to the right place in order to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Captain Hook, you have to find Peter Pan, but in order to find Peter Pan, you have to unlock the hangman's tree, and then um, and then you find Peter Pan, and he appears at the hangman's tree, and you've got to get him to the Jolly Roger, and then defeat him at the Jolly Roger. So anyway, um, mm. you know Prince John, he's he's pretty straightforward you have to have 20 of the money <laughs> so but That's, but it's, it's it's really interesting i played it once we had a we had a pretty good time so yeah but yeah we've we've played it's a, a fun bunch of concept them. for sure that's a really fun concept that villainous board game playing the disney villains yeah 
And then there was another one that we played and I'm trying to remember what it's called. I got it for my wife for Christmas. And uh, essentially you have like, you're building this realm and you, you pull in, you get, you get a God and you have the minions. I think it was made by the people who made Splendor. Anyway, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it and find a, put a link in. But uh, anyway, it was a pretty fun game too. I, I just played that with my wife a couple of times. So, hmm. But yeah, Pretty lots cool. lots of mentions. Um, I, I guess the last thing we should do, Joe, uh, we mentioned the DevEd podcast and where to get that. But uh, um, if people want to keep up on Thinkster.io or anything else that you're working on, where where do they go for that stuff? Yeah, they could probably Twitter is the best place. They can find me on Twitter at, at Joseph Eames. Um, but, uh, you know, check out Thinkster.io as well. Very cool. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, thanks for jumping on. Heck yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, folks. We'll uh, come back next week with more stories. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.